In this final video for lecture 14, we're going to solve another system of linear equations using the method of Gauss-Jordan elimination. Now, of course, things are going to look a little bit different this time, um, and, but that's actually the point of doing this next example. I'm going to illustrate some, some differences that we should be aware of as we work with these augmented matrix. Now, the first thing is, given the system of linear equations right here, you have the first equation, y minus 4z equals 8, 2x minus 3y plus 2z equals 1. And finally, 5x minus 8y plus 7z is equal to 1. Uh, the very first thing you're going to do here is write this as an augmented matrix. This is something we can mostly handle just fine. All right, so we're going to get a 0 in the first position because there's no x in that first equation. 1 minus 4, draw your line, and then you're going to get an 8 for the first row there. Then you're going to get 2, uh, 2, negative 3, positive 2, and 1. And then lastly, 5, negative 8. 7 and 1. So this is our augmented matrix and the first column that's non-zero, which will be our non, which will be our pivot column, it's going to get a one, uh, it gets a pivot position in the 1 1 spot. Now there is a zero in that pivot position, so we got to get something non-zero in there. We have a couple of options in uh, how to do that. So one option you could do is you could interchange just the second and third rows, um, and if you uh, second and first row, excuse me. And if you do that, you'll get 2 negative 3 2 1 uh, then this becomes your, your next row, 0, 1, negative 4, 8, 5, negative 8, 7, and 1. And so for purposes of Gaussian elimination, this is perfectly fine here. But be aware that trying to get a 1 in that pivot position right there is going to be a little bit problematic uh, because if you divide everything by 2, uh, you, sorry, you divide row 1 by 2 there, you're going to end up with in your first column 1, negative 3 halves, 1, and then one half, which some of those are whole numbers, but some of them are fractions. And so you should start trying to combine things together. There's like a negative eight down here that's gonna to have to combine with that, that negative three halves. And then there's a one down here that's gonna to have to combine with the one half, because we wanna get rid of this five after all. And so while we can do that, that's gonna introduce fractions very early in the problem, which could lead to complications later on. Nothing mathematically incorrect, uh, but it might lead to something arithmetically more difficult. Like we might make the computations more challenging than necessary. But conversely, you know, like, well, what was the other option, right? Do we instead interchange uh, rows one and three? We pull a five up there, because uh, then we're going to get this five, negative eight, seven, and one in the top. Uh, and then you're going to get two, negative three, two, and one. And then, of course, this thing sits here, one, a zero, one, negative four, and eight. Um, your pivot position is still the one, one spot, but you have sort of like the same problem. If you divide everything by five, you're going to end up with one, which is what you want, but then you're going to get negative eight, uh, negative eight fifths. You're going to get seven fifths, and then you're going to get one fifth, which honestly made those halves that we saw earlier look more promising. Right, so it's like, well, I can't really divide any of them um, to get a one in that position without introducing fractions. I don't really want to do that. Um, so it turns out there's actually another thing you can do. Now, this actually does break from the proper Gauss elimination technique, but for students in a class like Math 1050, this slight modification typically is well received. So what we're going to do is we're going to interchange rows one and three, like we said before, because you have a zero in the pivot position, you do have to get something non-zero in there. So I'm gonna grab the five. The reason for that in just, it will be presented in just a second. Okay, so the first row comes up, to uh, the third row becomes the first row, the first row becomes the third row, and then we didn't do anything with, um, we didn't do anything with the second row, so we just copy it down. Our pivot position is still the one, one spot. So what are we trying to do here? Um, I usually like to put those in blue, okay? So what we want to do is we want to get a one in that position. Scaling can be done, but it gets us some fractions. What we can do instead is use a row replacement. Notice the following. If I take row one, okay, and I replace row one with row one minus two times row two, this will actually give us exactly what we want. And why is that? Well, notice what happens here. If I take two times negative two, that's going to give me negative four. And pause there for a moment and think about that. Five minus, minus four is equal to, it's equal to one. It turns out that scaling is not the only way to get a one in there. Row replacements itself, if you want to play around with like, um, 
uh, combining the numbers, you can't, like, because in this case, 5 minus 2 times negative 2 gives me a 1. This can sometimes produce the 1 in a manner that doesn't revol involve the fractions whatsoever. And again, when this happens, the peasants rejoice and uh, life goes on. The, the peace is restored in the kingdom. We don't like to do fractions if we can avoid it. And this is a nice little maneuver that you can do here. Now, we have to do this for the whole row, right? 2 times negative 2. Um, it's 4. If I take negative 3 times it by negative 2, that's going to give me positive 6. That goes right there. 2 times negative 2 is, again, 4. And then 1 times negative 2 is 2. So we have to pay the price. You know, magic comes with a price here. And that price is we have to do the row, row replacement for the whole row. But that's a price we're probably willing to make here, that you're going to get a 1 there, 4 minus uh, 5 minus 4, excuse me. Then you're going to get negative 8 plus 6, which is a negative 2. You're going to get 7 minus 4, which is a positive 3. And then 1 minus 2 is a negative 1, like so. We didn't do anything else to the other rows. Just the row replacement. So using row replacement can help you get a 1 in that pivot position. Now, I said earlier, this is a deviation from... Uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination. If you're actually following along with the notes for this exercise, I actually will finish this problem using the fractional approach we did earlier. Uh, that is, you interchange rows one and two, you divide everything in row one by two. This gives us fractions. You start doing some row replacements. That's how I proceed forward from there. I actually follow Gauss-Jordan to a T. Now, like I said, we like to avoid fractions because we're humans. Computers don't complain unless we can program them to do it, uh, which generally is not a, a good thing to do. But we as humans can sometimes struggle with the fractions. So this is a nice little maneuver that can help us out. Now, if you're working out, if you're working with really large matrices, we are actually slowing down the algorithm, and that is a cost we might have. That again isn't much of a problem for the computer. But if we are only working with like three by three or four by four systems. Uh, this slight slowing down to avoid the fractions, this D tour is generally well received and so that's how we're going to finish this problem here now that we have a one in the pivot position uh, we can get rid of the two below it very nicely so what we want to do is replace row two with row two minus uh, two times row one so we're going to get a minus two right here a positive four there a minus six here and a positive two like so uh, since there's already a zero in the um, in the in the three one position right here we don't have to do anything with that one so copy down the first row unchanged with the second row we're going to get a zero here negative three plus four is one um that's kind of fortuitous because that number is going to be my next pivot position so i got a one there uh, by happenstance, that's really nice. Uh, two minus six is negative four. And then lastly, one plus two is a three. And then copying down the other row here, zero, one, negative four, and eight. So now that my first column is completely row reduced, I'm gonna move to the second column, which then there was a one already in my pivot position. So I don't have to worry about interchanging or scaling. Um, I like the one that's there as, as there is. So what we can do is start row replacing. Uh, that is, yeah, do row replacement to get zeros here and here. Um, to get a zero in, instead of that negative two, we're gonna take row one and add to it two times row two. So we get two, we get a negative eight, and then we get positive six. I'm just gonna start recording the next matrix over here. So one, zero, we're gonna get a negative five, we're gonna get a positive five, like so. Nothing's changing with the second row. So we get zero, one, negative four, and three. Now for the third row, we wanna get rid of a one right here, for which case we can do that by replacing row three with um, row three minus row two. So we're gonna get a minus one right here, a plus four right here, and then a minus three like so. And as you start combining these together, you're gonna to notice something here. You have a zero, okay? Um, you're gonna get one minus one, which is a zero. Okay, that's what we expected. But next, you're gonna get a negative four plus four, which that we were not looking for. So we got a zero, 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 and then on the right-hand side, eight minus three is gonna give us a five, like so. So I want you to analyze this matrix right here. Um, this matrix, you ended up with your pivot positions in the one and second column. There is no pivot in the third column because the pivot position should be here, but there's no, there's a zero there and there's no other rows to get something non-zero from. So it actually turns out there's no pivot in that last column. Um, I want you to look at the coefficient matrix. You have a row of zeros. So the left-hand side of this equation looks like zero. Zero equals what? Zero equals five. 
Um, this is a contradiction. Uh, zero does not equal five. Uh, I, I just checked the, the, the book of almanacs of numbers there, and sure enough, zero is not equal to five. Because we get this contradiction, it turns out that this is an example of the inconsistent case. Uh, we've seen this before, and as you were working through row reducing a matrix, this will happen sometimes, that there is no solution to the problem. And you recognize that as you start row reducing. Now it turns out as we were row reducing this matrix, we didn't row reducing this column right here. Uh, it didn't help reveal it at all. It honestly came from row reducing this last row right here. And so when one looks at the proper Gauss-Jordan elimination technique, it turns out they actually don't look for pivots above and below the. Uh, they sorry they don't look for zeros above and below the pivot. The the proper Gauss-Jordan elimination actually looks for only pivots below the, sorry, looks for zeros below the pivots, ignoring any numbers above, and it'll come back to it later. Um, with the Gauss-Jordan elimination, there's actually what we call the forward phase and the backwards phase. In the forward phase, you are constructing your pivots, and you only construct zeros below the pivots. In the backwards phase, um, then you start putting zeros above the pivots and they get the names because the forward phase you move left to right putting zeros below the um, pivots but in the backwards phase you move right to left and you start then putting zeros above the pivots now one reason why the gauss jordan elimination does that now when we learned about it in this lesson i i kind of skipped over i actually combined the forward phase and the backwards phase for a math 1050 student that's sufficient you don't need the distinction there Again, that only starts to become really profitable when you start looking at bigger and bigger linear systems that we will not see in this lecture course. Um, of course, if you wanted to learn more about that, you should take a look at into a class like linear algebra, uh, which we then would play with this nuance about forward phase versus backward phase. That distinction becomes extremely critical in that situation. But one advantage of doing a forward phase first is that by ignoring the positions above the pivots and only focusing on the positions positions below, we actually would find this row of zeros very quickly, uh, ignoring many of the other calculations, because once you find this row of zeros, that tells you something. In this case, it told us that we're, we had no solution because it was inconsistent. Now, conversely, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, a separate problem, but let's imagine that our final matrix looked a lot like the matrix we had, 1, 0, negative 5, 5, uh, 0, 1, negative four and three. So suppose all that was the same, but, and then you have these, you have these, uh, this row of zeros, but suppose the last number turned out to be zero. So if that was a little bit different, I'm gonna hide the previous answer so there's no confusion there. If our matrix had instead simplified in the following way, we still have um, the same pivot positions. In fact, the coefficient matrix is in row reduced echelon form. Um, it's the exact same echelon form before, but we had this instead. When you look at the bottom row, this now gives us the equation zero equals zero. That's not a contradiction. That's actually universally true. Uh, no concern with that whatsoever. As a system of equations, this actually would tell us that x minus 5z is equal to 5. Uh, the second equation then tells you y minus 4z is equal to 3. The third equation tells you 0 equals 0, which again is like saying the sky is blue. It's not really, it's not restricting the solution whatsoever. It's not so helpful, so you can just remove it from consideration. Uh, we don't need that row. Um, now we have an equation with three unknowns, two, uh, sorry, three unknowns, two equations, uh, but notice that x and y could be expressed in terms of z. If you solve the first equation for x, you're going to get x is equal to 5 plus 5z. And then the second equation would be y equals uh, 3 plus 4z, like so. So if you treat z like a free variable, then we get the following general solution. So let's say that z is equal to some number t. It's just some unspecified real number there. Then you're going to get your general solution. x is 5 plus 5t, y equals 3 plus 4t, and then z was t itself. Like so. so this would be our general solution in that situation. So what I want to illustrate here is that as you're row reducing your matrix, if you do get a row of zeros, you do need to check. Um, do I get a contradiction? If you get a contradiction, it means there is, uh, if you get a contradiction here, it means there is no solution. It's the inconsistent case. But if you modify it, so you have a row of zeros that's equal to zero, it means you can disregard that row. And then most likely, since you lost a row, um, that means you, you essentially lost an equation. You have more equations than 
uh, excuse me, have more variables than equations. And in that situation, you're gonna have free variables and therefore you can draw, you can uh, determine the general solution using those free variables and those dependent variables. And so this illustrates all the possibilities you can see when you're working with linear systems and solving them with these augmented matrices, that is solving and using the Gauss-Jordan elimination technique. And it turns out that while it has a high learning curve compared to some of the other techniques we've learned to solve systems of linear equations, this is a highly effective technique that's extremely efficient, extremely fast, and it produces the correct answer, which again, when a student masters it with very, very little error. And I do highly recommend as you work through linear systems and you practice this technique of Gauss-Jordan elimination, it'll prove fruitful for you uh, moving forward. And with that said, that does bring us to the end of lecture 14 and also brings us to the end of discussing systems of linear equations. We'll revisit the topic of systems of equations later on in the semester, but in those cases, they'll be systems of nonlinear equations, but that's something to look forward to in the future. Uh, but like I said, that brings us to the end of lecture 14 right now. Thanks for watching. If you learned anything about uh, augmented matrices, linear systems, Gauss-Jordan elimination, any of that stuff, please like these videos, subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this in the future. Um, if you have friends or colleagues who might be interested, share these videos with them. I'd be, I'd be glad to uh, have them watch them too. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments below. And I'll be glad, I'll be glad to answer them as soon as I can.